welcome everyone. Um, I'm sure we'll be having some more people soon because it's an absolutely fascinating topic and increasingly important these days when publishers are, are um, very reluctant to do anything decent for authors. Uh, so we've got two real specialists uh, talking today. Um, we've got Wink, who's um, back in the 90s um, worked uh, with Webster's uh, wine publishing. So she's got publishing background as well as her long writing and education background. And um, she was the last editor of Circle Update before Amanda took it to the new online form. Um, she's been a member of the Circle for ages. And her particular qualifications for this are her two highly acclaimed books, Dura Wine and Wines of the French Alps, which she funded through Kickstarter and self-published great success. And our second speaker is uh, Stephen Quinn, who's been a journalist and author for a very long time. Um, and he's written 30 books um, since 1997, 26 of which were conventionally published, and then he discovered self-publishing. Um, so uh, he's, uh, and that has uh, opened up all sorts of possibilities. He's also um, been uh, editing uh, uh, self-published books for other people and he's uh, got a long and distinguished journalistic background as well. So let's hand over to them and um, Wink will start uh, and um, do please put all your questions into the chat and we will open up the discussion at the end. Over to you Wink. Wink you need to unmute. Oh, I'm unmuting. Okay, I'm starting again. Hi, um, welcome to everyone. I'm suspecting that this presentation is going to raise more questions than it does answers somehow, because uh, I feel that Stephen and I are only going to scratch the surface. Um, I, I'm just sharing this presentation at the moment so that uh, uh, we can have some focus on this. Uh, I'm going to raise a few points uh, through the process, through the self-publishing process, and then hand each point to Stephen for his view, because he and I have approached the self-publishing process quite differently. And then uh, at the end, before questions, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Stephen Skelton, who's also self-published a lot, to give any comments as to how he's done things differently, better, worse, etc. And likewise with Simon Wolf, who also has experience. And then obviously any other input, time permitting, is welcome. And so I just, just want to explain the background to this slide, that th this was my, my colour proofs uh, scatter proofs, as they're called, um, for my last book, laid out on the floor of my chalet when they arrived. Um, it's always a nice feeling when you, you reach that stage. So, why self-publish? Why on earth do it? Well, one of the advantages is that you control the process from beginning to end. And anyone who's been published by a publisher will know the, the feeling of, of losing control to that publisher and, and not being able to, to call the shots all the time, even though it is your book. Well, once you're a self-publisher, it's the opposite. It is absolutely your book. You control, the, the buck stops with you. You're, you are really in charge of that process. Uh, but the other big advantage of doing it, in my view, is for the money. Um, if you're not doing it for the money, there's not really much point. And yet, being with a publisher, um, it's impossible to do it for the money. So I just thought I'd just throw out one figure, which is a totally personal one, and you can all come round for a drink afterwards. But um, if, if you if you sell your if your selling price of your book is £25, which for many wine books is quite a common sort of price, then uh, the average you will receive from a publisher would be between one and one pound and one pound fifty per book from that £25. That's what you'll get. Whereas um, I get 
after all immediate costs um, and even a contribution to the creation of the book, uh, not my own personal time, of course, I get 10 to 15 pounds a book on average. So that's 10 times as much. Um, now that's because of the way I do it. You won't always get that much, but it's a big advantage. So the disadvantages, the fundamental ones are that you've got to come up with the money in the beginning. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, you really do have to manage that production process from beginning to end. You've got to do it. You've got no one holding your hand unless, and, and they do exist. There are people who help self-publishers through the process. Um, I can't, and, and there's a, a few people, some ex-circle members who are doing that and, and so on. So apart from that, you have to do it from beginning to end. And then personally, the one that I think is most challenging of all is the distribution, which um, unless you give it all away to Amazon, which is one of the is things you can do, is very time consuming and arguably very complicated. Um, Stephen, what do you have to say? Pros and cons. Mm. I, thanks, Mick. I essentially agree with you. All I'm going to do is elaborate on some of your points. Um, this was the last book I published with a traditional publisher, Focal Press, in the United States. It currently sells for £33. And every sale I, out of that, I get one pound 32, not even really enough for a cup of coffee. So um, that book is, is considered a bestseller. Uh, the Wall Street Journal defines a nonfiction bestseller as a minimum of 3,000 copies. Uh, this has sold about seven and a half thousand. Wow. Um, so even 7,000 times one pound 32 is not a lot of money. Um, so the advantage, the major advantage, is that um, so I published a novel a couple of years later, a thin little thing, 100 pages. It sells for four pounds on Amazon, and I get two pounds 80 from that. So there's a big advantage financially. The other, I totally agree with Wink that, that control, you have control, so you get to um, control, have an influence on the cover, for example. A typical classical publisher, with my experience, they'll give you possibly three cover designs from which you choose one. Uh, whereas if I'm, I get to control it by, by designing my own cover. Um, the other advantage that we didn't mention is that it's relatively fast. Self-publishing, you can produce a book in, in a couple of weeks, um, whereas uh, traditional publishers will take probably at least a year in my experience. The main disadvantage from my experience is that you need reasonable technical skills if you do it yourself. So you need knowledge of things like typography, um, proofreading, indexing, cover design, things like that. The other option is getting someone else to do it for you, but that will cost you. And I'm happy, I've got some numbers here if anybody's interested in what it would cost for a typical cover design or proofreading or editing. I'm, I'm going to go through the process in a sec, but okay. we can move on to that. Okay. Um, um, and yeah, um, so essentially there's a great formula in life um, time versus money. If you've got time, um, if, you, if you've got money, you can pay someone else. If you don't have money, you need to devote your time to the process. And that's probably the other main disadvantage. It takes time to do the work yourself. Over to you, Wink. Uh, so, yeah, this process, the options are many. Um, I, I chose a very, very conventional option. Uh, that I effectively learnt through working with publishers and seeing how books were put together. So arguably, I've used a very, very old-fashioned way of producing my book, and it doesn't have to be like that. 
but it depends what you want to end up with, whether you are planning an illustrated book, for example, which is very complicated. If you're going to have a lot of pictures, maps, and so on, um, that obviously, well, it's not very complicated, but it can complicate the process. So I uh, wanted to just arguably put you off because um, there are very, there's a whole lot of things to think about now. Most editors and indeed designers and people who who um, do the page layout will all tell you that ideally you should write your whole book and then give it to them. Well, I am the living proof of saying that um, I didn't do that. And I can see Stephen Skelton laughing. I'm hoping some other people are laughing too. I don't think I'm the only one to not have done that. Um, I did everything on the hoof, everything bit by bit. Um, in terms of planning the writing, uh, if you work for, if you are with a very good publisher, then they're going to, there might be somebody who will handhold you. I can talk about Oz Clark. He's not here, but he's one of our worthy published members. But I saw the process of Oz Clark's books, and uh, trust me, the managing editor. Um, held Oz Clark's hand all the way through the process, whereas nobody was there um, apart from my dearly departed Brett with the first book um, to hold my hand through the process of writing. And so you've got to do that. Now, I have uh, in both books employed an editor and I've employed an editor who knows about wine. And that's another thing to think about when you're doing a wine book. If you just pick an editor from an, uh, a directory of editors or pick them on the basis of price, you will end up with somebody who doesn't understand wine. And if they don't understand wine, you're going to be inundated with a million questions that are going to take all your time. So there are quite a few qualified wine editors, but you might have to pay more for them uh, on, a, on an hourly rate. And also they might argue with you as well, the more qualified that they are. So think about all these things. Um, this illustration here is, um, I chose this and both my editors, I had two different ones, were quite surprised by my choice. Um, they were used to working with for publishers and when you write a book for a publisher you submit the script and then the editor works on it and then might come back with a few questions but you don't usually get to see the whole work in progress whereas i insisted on seeing the whole work in progress so we were back and forth the whole way through so it's your choice as to how much you want to go through that um costs can be anything from a few hundred to a few thousand depending on the length of your book depending how many hours are spent depending how much back and forth there is and how much your editor needs the work and is willing to be flexible and kind to you so um there are all those things to think about um i'm not going to spend long on sourcing and financing illustrations but don't forget it needs to be done and you've got to clear copyright for everything um if they're not your photos uh you if you need maps commissioning maps which i did with quentin sadler took me hours and hours and hours not because um uh, Quentin wasn't capable, Quentin's very capable, but because I wanted maps done in a particular way and I know my region and it gets complicated. Um, diagrams likely or likewise, all of this is a back and forth. Design and layout can be terribly, terribly simple and, and in fact the person I ended up working with um, who knew nothing about wine at all uh, was somebody who had more magazine layout experience than book layout experience. But to me, she was fantastic because she was someone I could work with. But I put a lot of uh, effort into that as well. So the time that she spent was arguably reduced by me, her working very quickly with an InDesign package and me then saying when I looked at the PDF, no, I don't want that like that. No, I don't want like that, like that. Likewise, with the costs on design and layout, it can be anything from a few hundred to a few thousand. You might even consider doing it yourself if you can do InDesign uh, or another publishing program. And then likewise with printing, well, first of all, your 
designer really needs to get the book ready for print, which is a particular process. Um, and then printing, uh, there can be print on demand, which I know very little about, but others know more who can talk about it later. Or once again, I did it in the old fashioned way. I got everything ready for print or my designer did. And I use a print, I use a person who outsources it, uh, in fact, to Malta and the books get delivered from the Gutenberg Press uh, in Malta. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful name but most people who've seen my jobs uh, my book seems to think seem to think they did a wonderful job it's not as expensive as you think if you do enough copies so in the case of my books uh, I can get away with under five pounds a copy for printing if I do at least two thousand um, and that's delivered to the UK um, and that and it can actually go quite a bit less than that uh, but I coughed up with all the money in advance. So those are just some of the process. Stephen, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, hi, thanks, Wink. I'll chip in with just some basic costs. Um, cover design, probably starting about £350 minimum up to a couple of thousand. Um, if you want to do it yourself, the self-publishing platforms like... Um, Kindle Direct Publishing provided by Amazon, they provide templates which, which you can use. But if you want to avoid the template notion and have something unique, you probably need to pay for a cover design. And that starts, as I said, at about 350 pounds. Um, proofreading um, works out at around about 15 pounds per thousand words or 25 pounds an hour, whatever you negotiate with the proofreader. Um, I recommend having your book edited professionally. That, the reason for that is that none of us deliberately makes a mistake. So you need a second set of eyes to, to edit the book for you. Going rates about 30 pounds an hour or an agreed fee per 1000 words of your manuscript. If you choose to have an index, the Society of Indexes recommends 25 pounds an hour or seven pounds 70 per thousand words. There are options of having everything done for you where you pay a one-off fee. Um, if you do a Google search for the term author help or the phrase writer helper, you will find scores of people offering these services. And I've typically seen them starting in around about 800 and 50 to 1,000 pounds to do the package for you. Printing will vary depending whether it's color or black and white. Uh, the last three books I've done have been little quite thin poetry books for other people. And these printed around about a pound 50 a copy. So a short print run print on demand through a company called Ingram Spark, they would probably charge you about a pound 50 per copy, assuming you buy 100 copies. But that's essentially for photographs in black and white and text in black and white and a color, a color cover. That'll do for, for the moment. Over to you, Wink. Okay. Okay, um, yes, in, in de things like index and proofing, um, in fact, you can, well, in my case, because I used a wine editor, um, we sort of did that together, um, uh, which is dangerous, but we were short of time. So uh, that is another, another way. Every, everything, is, everything is possible when you're the self-publisher. It's you calling the shots. Um, but I would stress once again that, that if you call on people who you find in a Google search, um, they're not going to handle wine books well, with the possible exception of design and layout. And, and uh, there, there they, they certainly, certainly do in, in my view. Um, so the, so that's, that's sort of a real race through the production. And we thought before talking about distribution, there is this question of raising money. 
and a lot of people ask me about crowdfunding because I have done it successfully twice. Um, as some of you may know, a blog post that I wrote after the first time, which is still rather apt. Um, but I will run through it very briefly. Um, I did it with Kickstarter and every single crowdfunding platform has uh, different ways of working. So I'm not going to get into that. But there are more reasons than one for doing a crowdfunding campaign if you, you want to self-publish. Of course, the obvious reason is for the money, but effectively it's a form of pre-selling. So if you have, a, in the case of, of mine, uh, 452 backers, well, in fact, that was about 600 books already pre-sold because some of them kicked in for more than one book. So that is also a way of doing your pre-marketing in a way um, because all of those people get very excited when they receive their books. So they do some marketing for you. So it's a sort of symbiotic thing and uh, it is very much not just about the money and in in my with my first book it was very much about seeing whether it was worth doing because had I not received my target and how you set your target is very important if you set it too high you'll never get it but if you set it too low then what's the point? You won't really have the money to do what you want to do. So um, pitching your price is very, very important and then you can go above it, no problem. But the only way to do it successfully, number one, most importantly, is having that really highly original idea, which you are convinced there is a market for and you are convinced that there are people out there who really want this book. And yes, you're going to test that market with your crowdfunder, but be prepared for it to fail if you have got yet another wine educator's idea of how to teach about wine. Um, and I speak as a wine educator. I've never dared write that book. People always tell me I should write a book about, about uh, the basics of wine, but so many people have done it. So do be convinced absolutely convinced you've got that highly original idea also you have to already have a high wide network of supporters in order to get new supporters in order for them to help you with the work of spreading the word and the obvious way of doing that is through social media but not only social media email marketing uh literally word of mouth in every form but don't do what somebody who will be nameless and is definitely not here did uh, when uh, a month before they launched a Kickstarter project, they went on Facebook and created a Facebook um, persona and did all that. You can't do that in a month. You need to have ideally several years of uh, having been on social media, being active in order to successfully use that to, to get your crowdfunding to work. And then last but not least, um, most of us uh, today on this, uh, in this webinar are British, not all of us. Um, we British are notorious for not wanting to blow our own trumpets and not wanting to sell ourselves. If you're going to do a successful crowdfunding campaign, you've got to do it. You have to have pictures of yourself constantly. Um, people will have been bored to tears by seeing me everywhere constantly for a month, pushing, 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 but it worked and it's the only way to do it. Um, so how else you raise money are, I think, all the conventional ways. Um, but crowdfunding is not a dirty, dirty or a new thing to do. It was done hundreds of years ago by, I think, Dickens and many other classic authors who got subscribers. And if you look in 19th century books, you will sometimes find a list of subscribers who funded publication of those books. So it's nothing new and nothing to be uh, ashamed of at all. And the other ways of finding money, I, I think everyone knows. So. I promised Stephen that I would <laughs> kick off and talk about distribution and promotion and all of that, but um, it really is a way, it is the way, the time everything can fall down. 
if you think your book's just going to sell itself, it isn't. So publishers are notoriously for notoriously known for doing very little PR for their authors, unfortunately. And public relations in every form is needed. Uh, I have sent out very few review copies, but I've always sent them out if people have asked for them and I felt they could do a review. But on the other hand, my own press releases, I've sent them out. So that's the sort of PR side of things. But the practical distribution thing really needs you to think something you need to think through before you even start the process. If you're going to do it yourself, as I do, you're going to need a good website. You're going to need uh, to be able to sell from your website. These days, that is not very difficult to do. However, where are you going to store those books? Uh, is it somewhere dry? Are they going to get corked, as some of mine did um, at my brother's place? Um, they became TCA affected. Um, and so much as I love my brother, he doesn't have a sense of smell, um, which is a bit of problem. And I had a few complaints saying that my books were corked. Um, so do think about your storage issues, where you're going to store them and make sure it's somewhere clean. How are you going to pack them? Uh, these days you can buy wonderful packaging for books that's very quick and very easy to use. If you've ever received books from Amazon, you'll, you'll receive them in, in packaging like that. Worldwide delivery. It's what you need to do, it's what you should do if you, if you self-publish a book, but you need to figure out how to do it. And only today I discovered that the UK post office has almost doubled the price of sending out uh, packages to the, from the UK to the US because there are fewer planes going across the ocean uh, because of COVID and be, it's not their fault entirely. The other end, the US Postal Service is kicking up a fuss about all sorts of things. I have another way of doing it through a, an online dispatch broker. These are th all things you need to look into. However, you can avoid all of that by using Amazon. And I'm going to let other people talk about that because I hate Amazon. I don't want to do it that way. I want to keep my money. I do Amazon Marketplace via a distributor. There are also, just to finish this off because we have very little time, um, very important mainstream distributors in the UK who you need to think about. Uh, the biggest is called Gardeners. Gardeners deal with all the independent bookshops and either you need to uh, deal with gardeners. Gardeners don't like dealing with individuals, so you need a distributor to deal with gardeners. Um, unless I've got that wrong, I have a distributor who does that. Uh, again, lots and lots of things to think about, but there's quite a lot on the web about all of this if you Google it. Um, but bear it in mind before you start on your project, your book is not going to sell itself and the logistics are huge. Um, Stephen, how do you, Stephen Quinn, how do you do use yours? Well, I have a small flat, so I can't store much in the way of books. So my way of doing it is doing it through Amazon or through eBooks, digital books. So to give you some numbers, 80%, 80% of all the English language eBooks on the planet are stored on Amazon. And interestingly, 42% of those are self-published. So Amazon is easily the, the 600 pound gorilla in the, in the panic. So I have a system via Ingram Spark and another company, whereas I produce the book, and it goes on to, it's stored uh, in, in um, print on demand, uh, print on demand system. So that if somebody buys it on Amazon, Amazon keep a handful of copies in their warehouse. And if there are more requests, then they can print extra copies quite quickly. So I let Amazon do all the work. For that, they take 30% of the price I charge for the book. So I get 70% of whatever it sells for. That's why my books 
uh, sell for anywhere between four and six and eight and ten pounds a copy because I'm still getting even at even at four pounds a copy on Amazon I'm still getting two pounds eighty in royalties and Amazon pay me a check every six months so that's the main reason I use Amazon I I don't have the space to store things and also I, as I mentioned before most of my books are color cover and black and white photographs and text on the inside. A couple um, of things I wanted to add earlier, I should have said, um, I'm very happy tradition with traditional publishers. My only complaint was the miserable royalties they paid me. But everything else in my experience, and I have published mostly with publishers in New York and Boston. So I deal with American publishers. And they do a lot of the extra work and one of the downsides of doing it yourself i discover is that when i published this book chaucer's team it's a literary novel uh, uh, it's about it's a retelling of the chaucer's canterbury tales set in a cricket team so i went to um uh to check the indexing of my book on a, a site called nielsen book data I'm sure Stephen Brooke could tell us more about these kinds of things. I'm no expert. I found my book Chaucer's team listed as a sports book because I had no control over the indexing. I'm sure a traditional publisher would, would have some say in that. Um, that'll do for the moment. We're, we're short on time, so. Wait. Stephen, um, could you, something I forgot to ask you right at the beginning was to talk about the advantages of ebooks. Could you just quickly mention that before I, pa I pass over to Stephen Skelton and Simon Wolf? Yeah, well, the great thing about ebooks is that you can, if you publish a book of photography, a cookery book or something like that, you have lots and lots of color plates. And if you print that book, it gets incredibly expensive but you can save that book um, using um, what's known as an iBook through using um, Apple's uh, free iBooks author software and you can make these color digital multimedia books which can be sold online so you have the advantage of color without the disadvantage of the cost and the weight of transport Okay, I, I, my books are in ebook form as well. So I'm, I've got Kindle and EPUB, um, but in flowing form, which doesn't look great, but people who buy them seem to be satisfied because they want to carry them with them. In fact, I have quite a few people who own both. They own the printed book to read at home and the e version whether kindle or epub which is epub is the form that is ibooks or any of the other platforms um they have them to travel with so it's an extra income stream for me i paid a fixed price to have them converted um but uh once again amazon leave me with very little uh but now i'm actually selling the other version on my website and so on uh, so yeah, uh, ebooks are definitely a good and, and very, very easy to produce, I think, if they're not illustrated at all. Um, if it's just text, um, you can use Kindle Direct Publishing free software and take you a couple of hours and you can produce a book from a, say, a, a Word file or a Pages file. Fairly easy to do. Okay. Um, if, have you got anything else to add, Stephen Quinn, or shall I add, pass over to another Stephen? Just one other thing. Um, the Writers and Artists Yearbook, which is an annual publication, a big thick yeah. red book most of you will know of, has a long, a big section on self-publishing. And there's a really useful Facebook group called How to Publish Your Book. So they're two useful resources. But there's also lots of stuff on the web if you do searches. Yeah. And I, I found my uh, layout person through the Alliance of Self-Publishers, I think it's called. Um, yeah. If anyone wants to check that one out, I'm no longer a member of it, but it was useful for me for a while. Um, Stephen Skelton, 
Hello. Um, Hello. Are you Hello. unmuted? I, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Um, could you tell us of any different experiences you've had, please? Yeah, well, like you, I've had experience with publishers. I've just had my first check, actually. I had two checks. The, the bank couldn't read the first one because the guy's handwriting was so bad. Who sends a check these days, anyway? Um, and I got uh, £1.98 a copy. Um, or oh, sorry, £1.89 a copy for uh, three years' work. So it wasn't a great return. 600 quid, of which they kept 15%. So I've been self-publishing since 89. Um, I printed two tons of books, 5,000 copies, slowly sold and went through all the troubles of distribution and so forth, packaging, waiting in the post office queues, and vowed I would never do it again. So I, um, but since print on demand, and I think you need to distinguish between self-publishing where you actually take physical hold of the books and you have your living room with two ton of books in it and self um, print on demand. And I'm very much a print on demand person. There's no distribution. There's no production costs, there's no inventory, but all the other problems remain, that of getting your book to the point of printing. Um, I'm right in the middle of updating my Wine Growing in Great Britain, which is my A4 size book. But one thing to remember about print on demand is they charge by the page. So the bigger the page, the smaller the type, the more economies you make. So I, I print my Times Roman quite small, double column, A4, and I get 175,000 words into 200 pages. There's the illustrations, black and white, it's only black and white interior, color cover back and front, tables, anything you want to put in, it's all down to you. So just going through some figures. So this update is costing me around three and a half thousand pounds of, of external costs. So that's proofreading, which is quite expensive, but it's a very technical book. So I have to have a good proofreader, one who knows about wine, as you, as you pointed out. An indexer is probably going to cost me a thousand, and I think you need a good index on a book of this size and of this type. Um, and typesetting is about six hundred pounds. So those are my upfront costs, about three and a half thousand. One thing I would say about writing any book is you have to have you have to have a target market and you have to have content. People don't. If you're selling online, people don't get a chance to handle a book. So glossy, lots of colour photographs, and so forth. They're not really going to see those. If they want the content, they'll buy it, almost irrespective of the price. Obviously, not crazy prices. But, you know, I sell this book, uh, very niche. English wine is very, very niche. And if you're writing a book about dogs, don't write a book about every dog. Don't write a book about gun dogs. Write a book about the lesser spotted, short haired, marsh gun dog. You know, there will be a society, a club, a team of people, breeders, who all know about that particular type of dog. The world is very small these days with social media and with emails. So English wine is obviously quite a niche product. And I'm selling of this book, the economics are, as I say, I sell this book through KDP, uh, Amazon. I think they're the best thing since sliced bread, I'm afraid. They sell, they take 40% of your, of your profit, but they handle everything. Only 40? Only 40 for my book. So 175,000. 170, yeah, but this is where they print on demand. 175,000 word book, A4, cost of production, wait to be astounded, £2.84. That's printed in Poland for the European market, but obviously it gets, it gets printed all over the world. I don't sell many outside the UK of that book. I do of my other book, Viticulture. Um, so, you know, 284, the, the cover price is 35.50 on Amazon. And I sell this is not a great amount. I sell about 25, 30 copies a month. So my average year is 300. I've been doing that book for seven and a half years. And I can tell you now, I've made 36,750 pounds out of that book to date. That's not including this month because the month hasn't ended. So that is the sort of returns you can make. Um, Viticulture, which is my other book, which is a textbook, WSET. I reckon there's 1,200 diploma candidates in the world. There's about 350 MW candidates in the world. I reckon about two thirds of them buy a copy. Uh, that sells for about 25 pounds. Production cost is actually very similar because it's about the same word length. It's a smaller size. Um, sorry, it's about the same page length. It's slightly, it's 170 pages compared to 200. But on that book, the sort of similar, I get about 13, 14 pounds, about 50, 56% on average of the cover price. That's the sort of figures. And I've got four titles currently running, and my average take over that is 20,000 a year. So
sometimes up, sometimes down. You know, I think self-publishing through print on demand is absolutely the way to go if you've got a book that people want. Right. Um, thank, thank you. Forget, um, distribution is a complete nightmare. Publishers are complete effers. Uh, and bookshops create, you know, bookshops are worse than wine shops. I mean, they want to send the bloody product back when it doesn't sell. Um, yeah, that's why yeah. I sell them direct. Yeah, um, I'm going to cut you short. The... Yeah, I'm finished. We've okay. got very little time. So yeah. I wanted to bring in Simon Wolf, um, who, uh, for those of you who don't know, Simon is the author. I'm sorry I didn't introduce you properly, Stephen, but I think everybody knew who you were. But Simon, just in case anybody doesn't know Simon Wolf, um, he uh, self published after a Kickstarter campaign, The Amber Revolution, the whole story or some sort of story of orange wine, and has other books um, in the wings, I think. Um, Simon, how are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks, Wink. Um, yeah, so I've done one self published book, Amber Revolution. I've also done a book with a publisher, which will be out this October. So I, I can compare those two experiences. Um, I think I think you've you've said lots of very worthwhile stuff, which I don't need to repeat. Um, just so, some interesting aside. I think I think most people, when they start thinking about doing a book, there's that feeling, uh, you know, which is more important to me, the glory or the money? Um, I went after the glory first. After after 13 publishers had rejected my book, I realised that actually I had a golden opportunity to do it myself. Um, and I'm very glad that I did do it myself, not just financially. Um, my, yeah, my return on this one book is really substantial. <laughs> um, I'm happy that I've learned something today uh, from Stephen. Um, I didn't know my book was a bestseller. It is. Um, it's on about 7,000 copies so far in the first two years. So. Um, so again, I, I think echoing what you guys have already said, if, if, if you know there's a market out there and your book is new or different or unique, or, or, um, then I think, I think it can work. Um, I sell the vast majority of my books via a distributor. The distributor takes 70% of the cover price. I'm still making good money after that. Um, you know, my, my lowest return, if I go via the distributor, is about eight euros per book. Um, and then I sell a certain amount on my own site and via various other channels as well. Um, I don't have any problem with them taking that cut because they deal with Amazon and Barnes and Noble and everyone else uh, on the planet, so I don't have to. And I do believe that I sell substantially more uh, because of them than I otherwise would have. So I don't mind that they take a large cut because I know all the, they save me from an enormous amount of pain. Um, I think some, some additional things that I learned along the way or additional financial things that were important. Um, if, you, if you do your book with a publisher, you're not just signing away most of your money, you're also signing away a lot of your rights in most cases. Um, my book is now uh, published in five foreign languages as well as English. Um, and I negotiated most of those deals myself. Uh, so of course I got all the money. Um, and that's actually, it's a big chunk of money. I mean, it's, it's an extra 10, 12K, I think, over the last year or so in foreign rights sales. Uh, normally with a publisher, a publisher will take 50% of that amount um, after any withholding taxes or whatever. So I think, a, you know, a good book really has a, an ongoing life and it has hidden financial returns that you can unlock if you're willing to, you know, if you're willing to do the work, if you're happy negotiating and organizing things yourself. Um, Wink, uh, Wink has done um, e-books from both of her books and actually I've taken some advice from her and I'm going to launch my own e-book from Amber Revolution this autumn. So that will be another kind of ongoing revenue stream. Um, so yeah, I do, I do think it's a very interesting market. I've also had a uh, couple of people in the wine trade tell me that they felt that had I done my book with a publisher, um, it would have been a vastly inferior book because the publisher would not have spent the money on it that I did. Um, so I did spend a lot of money on my book. I just went and checked actually in my initial costs for the book were 27,000 euros. 
Um, but I had all that covered by the time it was published because uh, my crowdfunding covered that. So it sounds like a lot of money, but it, it was all covered by pre-sales. Um, a publisher, of course, would have cut corners and wouldn't necessarily have gone for all the uh, fancy stuff that I did with the cover. Um, and so I think in the end, it was, a, it was a better book in many ways than it would ever have been with a publisher. And that was something interesting that I hadn't really thought about. Um, you know, if, if you're the bottom of the list of a publisher's priority, um, it's never going to be the same as when you do it yourself. When you do it yourself, you're top of the list. Um, I'm working on my second book. So the book I did with the publisher was a, was a commission for a flat fee. Um, but I'm now working on my second book and um, I thought about whether I should go after a publisher again. And actually I thought, no, why, why bother? You know, I can make much more money. I know my market. I know the people out there that are ready to buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's Good it. Good for you. Thank you. Um, Liz, were you... Well, I think that's been really informative. Thank you all four very, very much. Um, Victor, will you handle the questions? Yes, indeed. Okay, so Tony Harris has got a question and that he's asking, uh, I don't know whether Stephen Quinn could be, answer this, but are there any pre preferred genres of wine books that publishers prefer? Huh. Ones that sell. Have I... Is Stephen, perhaps I've muted you, Stephen. Yeah, I, I can't comment because I'm, none of my books have been about wine. Okay. I should have can said we, that. Can we ask Wink then to answer that one? My books are mostly about poetry and literature. Okay. Um, I, I can't answer that, Tony. Um, you know, I've, I'm a self-publisher. Um, it's very hard to get any books published uh, by wine books published at the moment. Um, it's just like anything, you, you need a, a great idea. Um, whether you publish, whether you approach a publisher or not, you just heard from Simon who, who had a fabulous idea, very timely to write a book on orange wine and was rejected by 13, was it 13 publishers or something? And uh, I myself, for my original Jura book, I think I only asked one and then I lost heart and I, I couldn't be bothered because they, they just take, they also take so long as well. And if you've got the right idea at the right moment, you need to, to get on with it. And uh, that, that's another point is timing. So impossible to answer, Tony, unless anyone else in the audience wishes to raise a hand and answer that. Uh, I could chip in on that. I was incredibly fortunate with my English wine book. I had no plans to write any wine book and I was approached by the publisher to do it, um, which is really quite exceptional. It's a small publisher. They were absolutely wonderful. I don't get very much money out of it. And I did have a big issue with an editor who knew nothing about wine, um, but the publisher put all that right. And that, that was absolutely great. But it, it seemed so much a matter of chance. I had done a book with the same publisher before on a different subject and therefore they knew about me but they it was the publisher that came up with the idea or the commissioning editor came up with the idea that they wanted a book on english wine and they asked me and i didn't want to do it um. <laughs> yeah okay well you have to be in the right place at the right time i think <laughs> i think just uh, i think maybe. niche niche is the answer find a niche whatever it is but don't go too big Right. In, in general, uh, pub publishers don't like taking risks uh, and they don't want to do anything new because if it's new, they don't know if it's going to sell. Um, so, yeah, my experience, publishers are really only interested. If you can come up with a, a reason why they can publish another book about champagne, then they'll do it because they know that books about champagne sell. They don't know that books about orange wine sell. And they weren't interested. So... Ellen Wallace has got, I think she first got her first point is that Amazon had been a loss maker for her and uh, she only used them now for the US. And this is a small market for my Swiss wine book. You get charged plus the cost of shipping is very high. But she's asking a specific question and that is that if you use Apple iBook software at this point, can you sell them on Kindle? I would think not. Would there be any reason to use no. the Apple software rather than Kindle Direct? That's her question. Mm. No. 
Um, I can give you some, some data on that. So I mentioned earlier that 80% of all the English language digital books are on Amazon. Uh, another 10% are, are iBooks uh, that are sold on what used to be called the Apple Bookstore using, uh, but you needed to use a specific software called iBooks Author. Now, as of last week, I think um, Apple announced they're discontinuing that software. Um, they've made it easier. If you use the Pages word processor that Apple produced, it's similar to Word made by Microsoft, you can actually produce digital books through Pages now. If you so, if you're familiar with Pages, you should be able to produce an iBook using Pages. That's according to the to an Apple website. I've not done it, so I can't comment. And the other 10%, so 80% Amazon, 10% um, Apple, and the other 10% are represented by um, Barnes and Noble, which used to be called Nook, Kobo, Ingram Smart, Ingram Spark, Smashwords, and Lulu. They represent the other 10% of the the English language market. Um, Steve, can I just say something on that? I just had my viticulture book um, made into an ebook by a professional professional company. Very, very good. Six hundred pounds for the whole thing on every one of those platforms that you mentioned. So the whole lot, ten different yes. platforms, well, and I thought that was a bargain. Yeah, I, a and I've done mine for less than that, um, under four hundred pounds. Uh, and basically the professionals that do it um, will do a, a Kindle version. There are effectively, as far as I know, two versions in terms of software, the Kindle version and then the EPUB version. And the EPUB version works on all the other platforms that Stephen mentioned. And uh, you, the same person can do it on both for you. And you pay them to do, well, you pay them to do it, but normally what happens and what I imagine Stephen Skelton, you did, is that you allow them then to distribute it for you. Um, well, that's what I have done. The price might have been lower because they are doing the distribution and then I will get the commission from that. Well, on, e on an e-book, there isn't any distribution, is it? They just click on a button. Sorry, and I didn't hear that. On an e-book, there isn't any distribution. No, but with distribution in the broader sense, they put yeah. them all, they, they, they actually put them onto the platforms and they collect the money yeah. and then, and distribute it. Yeah. You get about 50% of the cover, but something like that. Uh, I get a lot less than that. We should talk about that another day. Okay. <laughs> it depends where it's sold. Uh, yeah. Maybe well, he, yours are sold mainly in the UK. I guess mine are sold all over the world and I get much less. No, the video um, culture is worldwide. Um, but, but. Uh, Ellen, addressing your your question, they're different, and they they one doesn't work on the other. Don't try and do it yourself. <laughs> okay, so Marie is saying that she's using Pages and and telling us that you can share online real time with your editor, and it's very good. And Paul White has got a question for Wink: Is do you use watermarks in your photos? Do you worry that they can get hacked or stolen? Um, no, I don't use watermarks. Um, uh they if you're talking about the ebook versions um it, it is that what you're asking me about the ebook versions paul paul may well be on mute in which case i will try paul to. white could you could you unmute yourself because i'm trying to um yeah well i uh, put it this way I mean, nobody yeah, is supposed yeah, to steal pictures, um, but watermarking them is not feasible to do and wouldn't be right. And uh, I can assure you that any of the pictures in my books that are taken by Mick Rock, um, he actually has a company who works for him in chasing up people who steal pictures and he earns more money from uh, the fines than he does from selling his actual pictures. So, uh, <laughs> um, so I don't think he'll mind me saying that because it it, it serves as a, a warning to anybody for stealing his, his or anyone else's pictures. Um, so, no, a watermark would not be feasible. You know, if I could follow up, can anybody hear me? 
We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. No, I, I was thinking more in terms of an ebook. Um, I don't see anybody, any, any way anybody can steal a picture that's in a, a printed book. But if it's online and you have high enough resolution in, in, uh, in your ebook, and perhaps you're not having very high resolution in the ebook, I don't know. But if it's a high quality photograph, uh, it would seem to me to be quite easy to steal that and use it elsewhere. So. I think it is easier, but it's certainly not as easy as it would be from a PDF book, for example. That that PDFs are notorious for having people stealing everything from them. Um, but I don't think the quality is as high, and I don't think it's as easy. But I don't have the experience to answer that anymore. Okay. Anyone okay. Else? Well, thank thank you very much. I don't think we've got any further questions. So perhaps I can hand back to Liz. Well, this, as I said, has been a really informative uh, and valuable session for everyone. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, maybe we'll look forward to seeing a whole raft of new self-published books coming from members of the circle and our friends in due course. I think uh, the more that there can be out there, the better. Uh, it's sad that people tend to want to drink wine rather than read about it because there's so many wonderful stories to tell. But that's how life is. So thank you both very much indeed. And thank you to Stephen and Simon and everyone who took part.